How many of you have trained a neural net on any kind of medical image? Oh, wow, cool. So great. So um, those of you who haven't raised the hand for the last question, I will bring you up to speed quickly. So medical images are just like other images. The, every bit contains some information. They're highly the pixels in the image are highly correlated. No single pixel carries important information, but together they tell us about health state of a patient. And so medical images are excruciatingly hard to work with because, again, the information is diffuse. Um, the information is diffuse, but the requirements are pretty stringent. So in computer vision, people love talking about semantic segmentation. And basically, one person's semantics is very different from others. In medicine, quite often, there's consensus on what the physicians want to get out of the images. But oftentimes, it's very, very difficult to do so. And so we've been struggling with different interesting problems over the years. And what I'll show you today is one example of that. I should also say that this work is in collaboration with lots of really great people who I will acknowledge at the end of the talk. What I wanted in the front is actual graduate students I worked with who deserve lion's share of credit for this project. So what I want to tell you today is um, an example of using machine learning and to get clinically relevant information out of images that we have been working on. And specifically, the question is heart failure um, monitoring and support of clinical decisions in heart failure. So to bring you up to speed on heart failure, what happens is heart failure is a chronic condition. Um, oftentimes when patients have it once, then quite often they come back to the hospital and it's sort of like the best hope we have right now is to stabilize the condition. And once in a while there are these acute events where the heart stops working properly. And when that happens, basically the heart is not pumping the blood as it should, there is a buildup of pressure in the blood vessels and um, fluid seeps from the capillaries into the air sacs on the lungs. So somewhat counterintuitive, but the most direct way to observe heart failure is to take an x-ray of the lungs. And so the x-ray images will look differently if the person has a heart failure because the fluid in the lungs shows up in a set of discrete features that I'll talk about later in the talk. And so th what the physicians do when somebody walks into an emergency room is with the shortness of breath. So it's interesting. Basically, the kind of very quick symptom of heart failure is shortness of breath. So you think the person is having troubles with the lungs, but actually it's the heart that is the problem. So if somebody walks into an emergency room with shortness of breath, the first thing that they do is a chest x-ray to rule out heart failure or confirm it. Um, and of course, there are many other indicators that are used to diagnose heart failure, but chest x-ray is one of the most important um, factors in how physicians think about heart failure. Now, and so because the information about it is very diffuse and captured in the entire image, um, basically two things are hard. One of them is a patient walks in, you get an x-ray. That patient might have been in that emergency room five times in the last three years with up to 20 x-rays taken in previous visits. So there is lots of information about how they responded to treatment before. And the physician needs to make a decision what to do now. So you can give, um, you can prescribe medicine and send them home if you believe that they will stabilize at home. If not, then the best thing is to admit them to the hospital. Alternatively, if you think that actually this is a critical situation, they get admitted into emergency room, very quickly stabilized, and then potentially sent home. Home. So there are many scenarios of how we could treat a patient like that. And in order to do that, it would be great to know patient history. Now, leafing through 20 x-rays is just not something a physician in the emergency room can afford to do. And as a result, oftentimes the decisions are made very locally in a very suboptimal way as the physicians themselves admit, uh, sort of admit. And um, our goal is to condense the information in the x-ray images in such a way that the physicians can get information about 
previous visits in history very quickly in a, in a sort of compacted way. That's one. The other one is if somebody proposes a different therapy, it's very hard to evaluate efficacy of that therapy if the answer is in the image. If the answer were a number, you could actually understand where the one therapy um, is better than another in a very simple way. Once it's in the image, it sort of gets really tough. So the bottom line is we would like to condense this image into one number, which is how severe is the fluid accumulation in the lungs. So the medical term for fluid accumulation is pulmonary edema. Pulmonary means in the lungs, edema means fluid. Um, and like anything in medicine, it's on the score from, it's a score from zero to four. Four means, uh, sorry, from zero to three. It's a four, um, numbers. So zero means there's no edema at all, meaning no fluid. Um, and three means severe. Now I should say also as a preview, that um, what's very interesting is, is these one and two, and so I put the medical terms, but oftentimes I will just say mild, moderate, severe. This is roughly how everything is quantified in medicine. Many of you who have worked with other clinical problems could say, oh, I've seen the scale before in a completely different area. And it's really because this is how people think. They think in categories of mild, moderate, severe. And what's interesting are these boundaries between none and mild and mild and moderate. Once you get into severe, it can be very severe or mildly severe, but at that point, the patient is in trouble. You need to admit them and, and administer serious therapy. So uh, what's really interesting is these first gradations, and the scale is not linear at all here, right? The big sort of like severe could mean many different things, but in some sense, in that case, the decision is clear. Okay, and so those of you who, even who have never seen the medical image say, I know how to do this. I will collect a very large data set of images with labels and I'll train a classifier or a regression model um, that will image in, produce an answer which will be the, uh, which will be the estimate of the severity. And then you can quantify accuracy and so on. So there is one subtle detail, which is there are no labels. And so, and, and it's pretty implausible in the medical context to say, oh, you can't upload these images to Amazon Turk and ask people, what do you think? Is this mild or is it moderate? Because basically a layperson cannot diagnose, cannot diagnose this disease. And so as a result, basically, we are sort of confined to physicians, di physicians labeling the images, which immediately means machine learning will not work because you can't have physicians in the U.S. I don't know how much physicians are paid in Europe, but I suspect even here it would be impossible to have a bunch of physicians labeling 10,000 images, which is what we know you need to get accurate performance. So, but on the other hand, this information is available. It's all, the physician already looked at the images. The problem is they didn't write down the number. They wrote down a poem, right? So radiologists write stories about images, and they know in their mind what this case is, whether it's mild or moderate or severe. The problem is they don't write down the numbers. They write sort of descriptions of what they see. So we will use those descriptions to improve our classification ac or to achieve classification accuracy. I should say, before I tell you this, I want to show you what our data looks like so that you get a sense of scale. So we're extremely fortunate to be working with physicians in one of the Boston area hospitals who set out on this fantastic project of um, taking all of the chest x-rays that were acquired at the hospital, so it's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, de-identifying them and releasing them to, for public research. So for those of you who are interested in getting involved in clinical applications, this data, I have links. If you missed the link, you can send me an email, I'll point you to it, but mimic is the key word to remember. Basically, and so we served as a beta test site for this project where we worked with the data and told them if we can still see some personal information that then got redacted and randomized and so on. So it's a treasure trove of information. We work mostly with images and radiology reports, but these patients have 
every lab test, every medication prescribed, everything released as part of this data set. Uh, I say it's publicly available. Those of you who work with medical data know that what this really means is that you have to sign probably a page-long data user agreement that says you'll be responsible user of this and not post it on the website without, well, actually, you can post it on the website, but um, sort of do it responsibly in a way that is respectful of patient information. Okay, so for our project, what's important is that it's about quarter million images, about 20,000 of them are in the chest x-ray, uh, sorry, in the, in the um, so these are chest x-ray images, right, 20,000 of images are in the heart failure cohort. Um, as you can see here, every patient has more than one image because oftentimes when the patients are admitted, every 12 hours, somewhere between 12 and 24 hours, another chest X-ray is taken to assess the, the, the state, the health state of the patient. Now, what we have done is written a bunch of, so people love talking about natural language tools. What they really are are scripts with negation check where we look for keywords that our clinicians, our clinical collaborators identified as important to every stage, and we label some of the images that way. These images are incredible, uh, sorry, these labels are incredibly noisy. And also, we could only label about 6,000 after, uh, about, uh, out of 20,000. And the reason for it is twofold. One of them is some of the images I described with the reference to the previous image. And so our simple scripts can't do that, can't handle it. So for example, a radiology report, it's a completely legitimate radiology report that will say no change from previous image. Or it could say edema has worsened. Sometimes it could say not inconsistent with and say something. So some of the images, are, some of the reports are of that kind, and so we can't label, label them right now. Um, we actually have an ongoing project on figuring out how to longitudinally label a sequence of reports. But the other um, issue is that sometimes the case is complicated. And so the radiologist is describing this complexity of the case, and our simple tools can't handle it, basically. Okay, so that's the kind of data. And so what I want to show you now is uh, what we have done in this project. I should say up front that if you take those 6,000 images for which the label could be extracted from the geology reports and retrain supervised classifier, this is how we started five years ago. You get accuracy that is just not good enough. And so we show it to the physicians and they say, eh, cute. Um, but they would never use this in practice. So what I'll show you today is several examples of work that we have done to actually bring it to the accuracy where they would, they would consider putting it into emergency room and have that information available to them sort of for every patient. Okay, and so the way I will do it is I'll show you how we model this data, show you experimental results, show how we improved the model, and then conclude. Okay, and so the key idea is that, again, the person has looked at the image and coded this. Granted, it's not a number, but natural language, it turns out, well, so first of all, radiology reports are not written in a natural language. It's something much more constrained and much more coded. And so the information is already there, even if we can't very quickly converted to a number. So we will use that to build models that work well on images alone. <laughs> so let me show you how it's done. Okay. Well, sorry, how we've done it. <laughs> so the top stream here is your classical image classification pipeline, right? I'm somewhat arbitrarily breaking this image classifier into image encoder and image classifier. For now, just humor me. So you can think of this ZI as a latent representation taken from some layer of the network, some intermediate layer of the network. Okay, and so the way I think of it is that X is an image and it goes through image encoder there is some representation that I will read off an internal layer. Then there is a classifier that gives me an answer. You remember, non, mild, moderate, severe. And this loss is cross entropy. If you like something else, think of something else in there. But basically, it's a loss that penalizes errors. There is no innovation in there. 
Okay, so here's my report. And it turns out you can do exactly the same thing with natural language, where I can think of this classifier as consisting of text encoder. We use BERT models. Uh, so these are language models that are somewhat sort of strangely take out a word and try to predict what the word would have been from the context. And so that's the encoding that you get for, of that text. And so that's a BERT model. And in our experiments, we use BERT model that was trained on scientific and then clinical data to kind of push it closer to the domain. Then text classifier, again, just like here, you can think of ResNet, DenseNet, whatever network you, you like working with. <laughs> Okay, and so this is, again, cross-entropy loss that penalizes the differences between the predicted label and the ground truth label. Now, here it's a little bit weird, right? The ground truth label was our scripts that extracted the numerical label, okay? And so it turns out that this problem is much easier than this problem. When I train classifier based on those numerical labels, I get, um, so I'll measure everything in the area under the curve performance for classification. Um, we also can put thresholds on these classifiers and predict, sorry, measure accuracy. I just don't want to inundate you with numbers. We'll stick with the uh, area under the curve and our papers report all of the indicators. So if uh, we train the classifier just on images, I get something like 0.72 to 0.76, depending on how you measure it and how you set up the problem. And as I said, that's just not good enough. If you do this on text, you get 90s as area under the curve. It's not surprising because basically what happened here is that this text encoder has actually hidden in it a really powerful text encoder, um, sort of information encoder, which is a person looked at the image and then coded it in natural language that is much closer to numerical information than the image. And so humans have done encoding for us already. So in some sense, it's not surprising that this pipeline works much better than the image pipeline. Okay, so how can we make them closer to each other? That's basically the goal. And the way we will do it is we will take this representation and that representation, so the representation of the image and the representation of the report, and we force them to behave similarly. And the way we will do it, for those of you who have seen contrastive learning, basically it's sort of, it's very similar. So by now you can just think of it as contrastive learning. When we were building this, we sort of discovered contrastive learning as we were doing it. But basically you can think of it as contrastive learning. Those of you who have never seen contrastive learning, what we will do is we will force a representation of the image and the representation of the report from the matched pair, meaning the pair that came from the same imaging event, to map close to each other in a latent space. And if I take any image and any radiology report and put them into that space, I will try to push them apart. And the way, so, so it turns out that doing just pushing together has the singularity where everything gets mapped to one point and then everybody is close to everyone. And so you do need this contrastive part where the representations of mismatched pairs are pushed further apart. And so our loss function is written out here. A couple of slides later, I'll switch the loss function on you a little bit. But all of these loss functions are the same in the sense that they say embedding of matched pairs should be much lower, sorry, the distance between matched pairs should be much smaller than the distance between mismatched pairs. So in some sense, the distance between matched pairs is measured in terms of the distance between mismatched pairs. So the way you minimize this, uh, the way you minimize the loss is by um, look, basically by making this big and this small. And I will... Um, as I said, I will swap the losses because this research evolved over several years. So the students got enthusiastic about trying different variants of this. But the bottom line is always the same. We will force the matched pairs to map close to each other and mismatched pairs far away from each other. Okay, great. And so why would this help? And the reason why it helps is twofold. One of them, my, very direct, this works really well. So if we can drag the representations of images 
into the space where the representations of text live, then they will classify, hopefully much closer to how the text representations classify, rather than in the original space. So effectively, we're using information from text to deform the latent representation for images, or rather, um, insisting that they live in the same space. Um, and by that, improving the accuracy of image classification. <laughs> The second reason is more subtle, and I'm still... So everybody believes that this is true. The problem is that empirically, it's much less true than we would like to believe. And so the second reason is that even without this issue, there is a lot of structure of interaction between these two data sets. So if I have a huge unlabeled data set where I know which image went with which report, then somehow encoding that information will shape the latent space better. That latent space will represent the structure of images and reports better than if I just try to learn it on labeled images. So the statement sounds aesthetically really great. And my only hesitation is that in all of our experiments, it has much more subtle effect and smaller effect than actually just dragging the images to behave like text that I mentioned before. So those of you who are very enthusiastic about self-supervised learning, which, which I am in that camp as well, we need to work harder to understand what is it that we're missing, how come the improvements don't come in these big globs of improvement to classification accuracy. And I'll show you the improvements to classification accuracy due to this unsupervised, unlabeled data are smaller than I would like to see. Okay, so this is what we are going to do during training, right? So we update all three losses, backpropagate with respect to the... So the classification losses affect the entire pipeline on top and on the bottom, but this embedding loss only affects the encoders. It doesn't look at the classifier weights at all. So if I have unlabeled pairs, you can see how they would be totally useless for training the classifiers, but by putting the unlabeled image, image text pairs into here and updating the embedding loss, I can affect image encoders. Okay, great. So then, during inference, I strip out the text and just apply the image classifier. And so this is an important difference between this application and many multimodal applications. So a lot of times applications or problems involve multimodal data, but then you have that multimodality both during training and during <laughs> inference. For us to remind you, the goal here is we have the sea of images and radiology reports. We want to learn information from that so that next time the patient walks into the emergency room, you don't have to wait for two hours for the radiologist to look at the data. You can acquire the image bedside and get the classification right there. Right? So during inference, the report is not available. Only the image is available, and our goal is to build image-specific spe image classifiers. And that's why we remove the remaining modalities. I should also say that what I'm showing you here is image text joint learning, but of course there is nothing super special about images or text that I've shown you. You can apply exactly the same framework for other multimodal learning. Okay, so let's look at let's look at the accuracy. So this is um, the way we evaluate our methods. Is remember we have something like 20,000 images that relate to heart failure, 6,000 of which could be labeled using our scripts. Um, and then in addition to that, we have 150 images that four radiologists looked at and classified as non, mild, moderate, and severe. It, Every time they disagreed, we forced them to talk about it and arrive at consensus. So we don't ever use those images or those patients, I should say, in training or validation or our internal testing. When we are ready to evaluate the methods, we run them on this sort of gold standard, silver standard data set, because basically it's, again, we're mimicking radiologist performance. We don't have access to real, real ground truth. <laughs> 
Okay. And so all of the accuracies are with respect to those 150 images that the radiologists looked at and classified as consensus among four of them. And so because we have this um, non uh, four grade scale, um, the purists would say you should train a regression model and, class it, and, and measure something like differences between um, the predicted labels and the uh, ground truth labels. We have tried that as well. It turns out regression models are finickier to train, and once you start doing multimodal on top of that, it's much easier to just work with classifiers. And so another way to think about this is build ordinal regression, which is basically classification, but it encodes the fact that one comes after zero, then followed by two, followed by three. And so I'm showing you results that are all based on on ordinal regression. So effectively, you can think of it also as classification if it's easier. In some sense, the details of how we encode the answer is not important. We've done all these flavors and the answer doesn't change based on how you encode the answer. Okay, and so because we have four gradations and because we're using um, classification. We will look carefully at each of the boundaries that I mentioned before. So blue bars will tell us how well I'm classifying patients who don't have any edema from the remaining classes. Red bar tells me how well I'm classifying the boundary between one and two, meaning mild and moderate. And this is in yellow corresponds to the boundary between moderate and severe. Okay, so there are always three numbers that, class, that sort of describe how well I'm doing. And so, for example, image only is the model that I didn't even show you. It's the model where I just take 6,000 images with, with script-based labels extracted from radiology reports. I train the classifier and I evaluate its accuracy. And as I told you, basically, these are the area under the curve numbers for all three boundaries. And those are the numbers that I said are just not good enough. And so then what happens is that when I train the model with the framework that I just showed you a couple of slides ago, but only using labeled data. So this is the same 6,000 image report pairs that this is trained on, except for trained jointly now with the text. So this is this idea of dragging images to behave like text as far as the classifiers are concerned. And we can see quite a bit of a bump here in accuracy. So the way to compare it is to compare the bars of the same color to each other. And we see that there is quite a bit of a bump. And so this is the story that is kind of the still yet. So... I'm learning to use the word yet, <laughs> right? Is yet disappointing up until now, which is that this is trained on all of the unlabeled data. So the hope here is that we are somehow shaping the latent space to, to reflect the structure in the images, right? By looking at all of these unlabeled image report pairs and doing contrastive learning on those simultaneously with the supervised learning. And we see, we get the bump, but it's just not as satisfying as it should be. It's not as big as it should be. Um, for those of you who are working on this, I would love to talk sort of during coffee break because we have some recent work that I think sort of is pointing us in the right direction. But since I can't tell you anything concrete and intelligent about this, I didn't include it in a talk. But of course, I'm happy to chat about this later. Okay, and so we... Get the bump, uh, the, we get the bump. Um, now, let me tell you kind of what's unsatisfying about this. Um, so, so we got this performance and it looked interesting and we built a little pilot software that sits in the emergency room and shows the physicians these scores. But one thing that is unsatisfying about this model is that it looks at the entire image and it looks at the entire report and it says the representation of the image and the representation of the report have to match. But if you think about this, this is the wrong way to go about it. Because the report is, there is much more structure in this data. And so in my experience, every time you can capture structure, you improve. And you also understand something about the problem. So here's what I want to tell you about 
um, so this is the bit that I want to tell you about in the next couple of minutes. And um, before I go on, there are many screens here, but I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> so I don't know how much time I have left. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to do this um, subtly. And I glance at the screens, and there's lots of indication of everything. <laughs> Just no way to tell where I am. <laughs> okay, so, so the next bit that I want to tell you about is this problem that information in images is inherently local. It might have spatial extent, but it's local. And information in radiology reports is also local. In fact, many sentences in radiology reports can be thought of as the semantic unit that says X happened at location Y. Many of them have the structure where there is a description of location or so, for example, this says basically everywhere in the image there is no plural effusion, right? But there is quite often is an implicitly or explicitly specification of location and then of the phenomenon. And here I've done this coding by hand. I basically colored the sentences and the image regions that match each other. And so it kind of feels that you should be building representations at that level, not at the level of images, for a couple of reasons. One of them is the radiology report doesn't describe the entirety of the image. For example, this report said nothing about the stomach that you can see here in the image. It's kind of right here. It said nothing about the bone structure that you can see shadows of, and so on. So the description is not one-to-one. -one. So it seems strange to demand that the representation of report and the representation of the image behave closely. Instead, we think aesthetically it's more productive, and we will see that it pays off, to think of it as a cloud of descriptors from image that describe these local features, and a cloud of descriptors from reports that describes each sentence. And somehow there is a relationship between these two. And so th what I'll show you now is a very naive, very straightforward implementation of this idea. And as I said, during coffee break, for those of you who are interested in this topic, I would love to talk more about this, because now we have more sophisticated ways of doing it, just not yet ready for keynote. Um, okay, and so here's what we're going to do. The way to tell you about this is to admit that roughly here, we switched from using the loss function that I showed you last time to thinking about how that minimization of distances for matched pairs versus maximization of distances for mismatched pairs corresponds to maximizing mutual information between images and reports. Um, for those of you who think statistically can go finally, for those of you who think in terms of distances, you can just keep thinking about distances. It turns out that people have shown equivalence between these two representations, and if you look at the code, it does the same thing. We just model probabilities as e to the minus the distance, and then you end up this, with this equivalence of maximizing mutual information in that space is equivalent to minimizing distances between matched pairs relative to mismatched pairs. So again, you can choose, and contrastive learning community basically at this point is entirely by model. Some people think about it as distances or energies, and some people think of it as probabilities and mutual information. But the bottom line is exactly the same. And it turns out people have been, it's been an active area of research that we are also part of, of how to estimate mutual information or that loss function based on distances on very large data sets. It's a very challenging problem. It basically sort of goes back to it's very hard to estimate distributions on complex multidimensional data. And so we don't have very good ways of estimating mutual informations that don't go back to estimating densities. But anyway, we will use a couple of estimators of mutual information sort of like as a helper function here to minimize our losses minimize the loss function. Okay, so this is exactly the structure that I showed you before, with the only difference is that now I'll think of it statistically, but as I'm telling you, under the hood, it's exactly the same idea. Okay, and so to remind you, we're training the upper stream with the cross-entropy loss, 
the lower stream with the cross entropy loss and this joint embedding loss forces these two latent representations to behave the same, regardless of whether they came from images or text. So to do local encoding, here is the modification to that scheme. We'll take an image, we'll break it up into parts. Given the structure of CNNs, this is done by just looking at pixels of the later layer, right? So a later layer will give me this partition of the image into, into grid. And I'll encode the image. So now I have, for example, 16 vectors, a cloud of 16 vectors that describe an image. A radiology report will get encoded at the level of sentences. So basically, each sentence gets a vector. And now I'm going to look at the distance between these two vectors. So the slide says, am I estimator? For, and again, to give you the complementary explanation, if you think of it as distances, then out of 16, I will find for this sentence the descriptor that is the closest to it. And I'll use that as a measure of distance from a sentence to an image and use that to measure my mutual information or loss function that you saw a couple of slides ago. So instead of looking at Euclidean distance between, between the encoding of the entire text in the encoding of the entire image, I'm looking now at sentence uh, to local representation, and I'm averaging it over all sentences in the report to kind of get sentence to um, report to image accuracy. And other than that, it's exactly the same framework as before. So, and of course, we use softmax so that we can differentiate through it and backpropagate with respect to the loss function. Now. I should say, before I show you experimental results, this is a little aside. Our in our recent work, we realized that this type of framework in contrastive learning corresponds to some of you might, some of you who are old enough might remember multi-instance classification. This was a topic very active in the late 90s, early noughts, where effectively the setup, and it was, it was inspired by problems in any kind of biology or organic chemistry, or like biological chemistry, basically. And the way to think about this is I have a test tube with a bunch of conformations of a protein, and I know that it reacts with some molecule, but I don't know which of the conformations reacted. So I have positive tubes and negative tubes, and so the negative tubes, I'm guaranteed that every conformation inside that tube does not react. But for the positive tube, I don't know which instance was, posit was labeled positive, right? I only know this at the level of the tube. So in the multi-instance learning, the language is that I have multiple instances in a bag, and the bag can be positive or negative, and for positive bags, I'm guaranteed to have at least one positive instance, but I don't know which one. So the training data comes in that sort, and it's been shown that you can actually effectively learn instance-based classifiers based on this type of data. So recently, we have shown the equivalence between contrastive learning of this kind, local contrastive learning is, is how we call it, and multiple, multi, uh, multiple instance learning, which means we get to borrow all the math that people have developed for multiple instance learning to do this aggregation over radiology reports and over images in a more principled way than what I'm showing you here. Like what I'm showing you here is this very particular naive design of I'm going to average over sentences but take max over the regions, but you can explore the space of aggregator functions, meaning functions that come up with distance between report and image based on local measures in a more principled way. And like we're basically in the midst of sorting this out. The theory is kind of clear and experimentally, it's very interesting kind of the properties that emerge. Okay, back to topic of this discussion. So, so this is the only difference from the previous uh, slide. So we will use this particular localized measure to quantify the differences. And so let me show you the results. I don't expect you to read all the tables. Don't worry about it. This table is just to impress you that we've done it with more than just edema. We actually ran it on sort of, at this point, classical, and I put them in quotes, because basically it's like machine learning community coming up what the classical clinical problems could be. There is always a little bit of a danger on that. But basically, in the space of classifying chest x-rays, there are about 14 pathologies that are classified based, uh, 
diagnosed based on chest x-rays, and people have been actively working on improving classifiers for each of the pathology. And so we used exactly the same pathologies to kind of verify our results going beyond pulmonary edema. And, um, and so basically, like, the bottom line is this local representation improves it every single time. And back to the pulmonary edema, I want to look at this in a little bit more detail and tell you what we've done. So these three columns, again, correspond to our bars. It's the three boundaries between 0 and 1 to 3, 0, 1 versus 2 and 3, and 0, 1, 2 versus 3. So these are the three boundaries that I'm interested in. All the numbers are area under the curve, and as I said, we can compute accuracies it just gets boring because they are completely correlated. So the two subcolumns in each column are the two different ways to estimate the loss function. So we're at a point where the loss function cannot be computed exactly, and we're estimating it from the data set. So these two are est two estimators. In our experience, it makes no difference which estimator you use. So the differences between two estimators are so small that it makes no difference to the empirical conclusion. But I'm including them here sort of for thoroughness. Okay. Image only is the supervised baseline that I've already shown you before. This is just images and the report and the labels that we extracted from the reports. Global MI is uh, the, the previous work. It's basically I extract the representation from an image, I extract the representation from the text, and I force them to behave similarly. And the reason why there are two rows is because you can first learn the representation and then keep it frozen and only train the remaining classifier parts. Or you can continue, train, uh, continue changing representation as you're training the classifiers, right? And so frozen means I first learned the representation and then only the classifiers got trained. F tuned means I kept training. And so this is the global numbers, and these are the local numbers. And the local numbers are the new idea, which is I'm going to encode the distances based on this maximally matching pair of sentence at the report, uh, sentence in the image region. And basically, local representation beats it all the time, but you have to continue training. This is a very robust kind of empirical conclusion. Again, I don't want to get buried in numbers. These numbers are better than those, and I can point at them and so on. But empirically, what we found in our experiments, that every single time we do this, if you take local representations, but you continue fine-tuning them for the specific task, after learning the representation, they beat the global representations and they beat the frozen representations. So it seems like they are both better at capturing the structure as well as adapting to the task at the end. And as I said, we have more experiments now that I'm happy to talk about offline. We just haven't put them together yet in a way that I can talk about it intelligently. And so for interest of time, I'll skip the last bit. I'll just tease you about how we have some ideas on how to use this joint representation to do model interpretability. And I leave it at that. Okay, and so our future slash current work is all about that. We're interested in this cross-modality information. So in medical imaging, so this is another thing that sort of is interesting in medical imaging versus computer vision. So how many of you have done, uh, have done grad cam of any sort or gradient-based sensitivity analysis? Yeah, it doesn't work in medical imaging at all. And the reason why is because in computer vision, when I say which bits cause the classifier to decide it's a dog? What I'm really asking is, where do you think the dog is in the image? I'm doing localization task by asking that question. And if you think about what the gradient-based sensitivity analysis does, it does exactly that. It says, where in the image did you pay attention to? Well, so if I give you an X-ray image of a patient who has severe fluid in the lungs, where do you think the classifier should look at? In the lungs. If I gave you an image where the lungs are completely clear of a patient who have no disease whatsoever, where do you think the classifier should look at? In the lungs. 
So the grad cam pictures we get are excruciatingly non-differentiated between patients who have the disease and patients who don't have the disease, and that's the right answer. Because if the answer is, where did you look in the image? The, the, if the question is, where did you look in the image? The answer is in the lungs every single time. And so these methods just make no impact, have no impact at all. The, real, the right question to ask is, what is it about those bits that made you decide that it's severe versus none? And so we've been kind of trying to get a grasp of that of various ways to answer that question. And one of the answers could be, what is the text that goes with this type of texture in the lungs? And so, as you can imagine, learning joint representations between image regions and text can greatly help this model interpretability. So this is kind of where we're going with it. Okay, before I conclude, I want to thank lots of amazing people who helped me with this research absolutely out of this world graduate students who just asked the right questions and drove this research. My amazing collaborators from MIT, clinical world, as well as Philips. Interestingly enough, Philips Research has this branch that cares about open science and so on, and they funded the research that made this data publicly available for your research pleasure, if you are interested. And of course, generous funding that enabled us to do this research. So to conclude, what I showed you today are neural networks that look at multimodal information to improve modality specific classification. So the idea is that you use all this information during training to build better modality specific classifiers. Um, we have shown that multimodal and local representations improve accuracy. There is no question about that. The question is, how can we use this to help physicians make better decisions? And so we are taking sort of two pronged approach. Academically, we're continuing to develop this. We're building prototypes that sit in the emergency room. One of the graduate students whose picture you saw finished his PhD last year and started a company commercializing some of these ideas and now has joint collaborations with um, one of the largest networks in the U.S., hospital networks in the U.S., to actually run a real clinical trial of this technology and hopefully by these combined efforts we will bring this technology to help the physicians make better decisions and improve healthcare. Thank you.